they will kill hundreds to thousands to tens of thousands depending on their employment. You can't see them, you can't feel them, you can't touch them. There's terror associated with just the threat of use of biological warfare agents. The idea behind a germ weapon is simple. Use a deadly virus or bacteria to attack your enemy. As far back as the Middle Ages, the bodies of plague victims were catapulted into besieged cities to infect the people inside. Plague is a good basis for a germ weapon as it's highly infectious and its effects on the body can kill within 48 hours. With modern technology, growing billions of bacteria is cheap and easy. Any reasonably competent microbiologist could make biological materials you know, probably with minimum amount of facilities. Now, I wouldn't perhaps want to go into detail about how one might make these materials at home, but a, but a microbiologist could, could make them fairly simply. The bugs are living organisms, which can die in strong sunlight or cold temperatures. For a weapon to work, they must be kept alive until they are needed. Today, we can produce deadly agents such as anthrax, a bacteria which can survive extreme climate conditions for up to 40 years. Anthrax causes septic swellings and blood poisoning. By the time the symptoms are discovered, it's often too late to save the victim. Once you have deadly germs capable of surviving, they need only to be delivered into the bloodstream of the enemy. To do this, they must be the right particle size to stay in the air and after being inhaled, to get through the mucous membranes in human lungs. Richard Falkenrath is a Harvard professor who has advised government agencies on the threat of biological weapons. More and more people are simply learning how to work with bacteria, work with viruses, than they were in the past. Um, most of them are never going to do anything uh, harmful with this knowledge. But some very, very small percentage might be. And the knowledge that this, this real revolution in the biosciences is creating is going to seep out there and go through all society, and somewhere in that mix might emerge someone who wants to do great harm. Few people outside China have ever heard of Harbin, and yet it should have the same connotations as the Nazi death camps. Today it is a thriving industrial centre. In the 1930s, when Japan occupied China, it became the headquarters of Unit 731 home to the world's largest biological weapons research complex. At the end of the war, the retreating Japanese destroyed most of the evidence, but some buildings remain. It was in 1939, on the 5th この細かい条文がいろいろ申し渡されたんですが、今でもはっきり覚えているのは、この部隊では見るな、聞くな、言うな、これが鉄則だろうと。What happened here was that Unit 731 perfected the art of germ warfare. Under the command of this man, General Shiro Ishii, Japan's brightest scientists bred cholera, anthrax and other deadly diseases. These pits once housed thousands of rats. They were used to cultivate bubonic plague. The worst horrors were reserved for this place. Thousands of prisoners were deliberately infected with disease. The doctors took careful notes. This was, after all, a scientific exercise. After the victims became sick, they were cut open while still alive. 
The doctors wanted to chart the course of the infection. Shinazuka is still haunted by his first vivisection. The victim was not given any painkillers in case it affected the germs. Shinazuka, who had no medical training, prepared the body. まず最初に水でデッキブラシを使って体を洗ったということは決してます。The leaders of Unit 731 tried to cover up what was happening here. They told the locals this was a disease prevention and water purification plant, when of course it was nothing of the sort. The prisoners themselves were called logs, a reference to their subhuman nature, and to the timber yard next door, where the logs were chopped up. <laughs> Unit 731's work was not confined to Harbin. The diseases developed there were deliberately spread across China. As many as one quarter of a million people died. The ghosts of that terrible past haunt the present. These people still remember the day the Japanese planes flew over their village. Not long after, everyone started falling sick. Soon after that, they began to die. The disease was cholera. The villagers thought it was a curse from God. Zhang Wenzhang's father was one of the victims. By the time he died, there were no adults left to carry the coffin. The men and women of this man's village developed terrible sores on their bodies. Liu Mu Shui was infected but survived and still bears the scars. Some of those who survived the unit's actions and the relatives of those who didn't have gathered to demand justice. They want an apology and compensation. In 1995, the Japanese government finally issued a general apology for the war, but it's yet to even admit that Unit 731 existed. The villagers are led by this woman, Wang Xian. She lost her uncle and one third of her village to the germs. A terrible death. It's like the end of the world. And there was a young woman, a uh, young woman was about 20 years old, was vivisected in this temple. 
behind me in the temple. And the, and the villagers still remembered her scream. He, she said, I, she said, I was not dead. I'm not dead yet. Don't cut me open. Now, for the first time, a member of Unit 731 has returned to the scene of the suffering. This time, though, Yoshio Shinazuka is armed only with an apology. It's the first time these people have heard a Japanese apology, and it means a lot. I think he is a hero. I, I probably, I might be the first one who said, I'm proud of him. I said, Japan should be proud of Shinotsuka. He is just an ordinary Japanese man. You know, he was, he was enlisted when he was a child. He didn't know anything. He tried to serve his country. But see the trauma he has, he has had post-war. A hero in China, perhaps, but not back here in his homeland. Other members of 731 consider Shinazuka a traitor, brainwashed by the Chinese authorities. They still maintain their unit was a force for good and have no sympathy for the prisoners who were vivisected. <laughs> Toshimi Mizubuchi used to teach 731's recruits. He now leads a comfortable life in Kobe and organises a unit's annual reunion. When the war was lost, Mizubuchi was given the job of destroying the evidence including leftover prisoners. これはあの、マルタ収容施設 as many as 12,000 human guinea pigs died at Harbin, but from this member of Unit 731, there's no apology and no remorse. Japan has a selective and subjective approach to its military past. They say the victors write history, but that's not always true. Japan lost the war, but more than half a century on, is still manufacturing its own version of it, a fiction the United States has been happy to endorse. The Yasukuni Shrine honours the two and a half million Japanese who have died fighting for their country, including convicted war criminals. Each year, on the anniversary of Japan's defeat in World War II, thousands come to pay their respects. It's Anzac Day with attitude. As far as these people are concerned, Japan has nothing to apologise for. Kihachiro Shimizu is a professor at a respected university. He is convinced Unit 731 never existed. 
なでたらめなんですよ。何金やったらだってそういう人失敗出してきた調べらしてお金もらってったりする。そのうちにね、50年、100年だったら本当の歴史がわかりますから、日本民族ぐらい悪いことしない民族はないんですよ。だから世界に彫刻になってるでしょう。In China, children are taught about 731 in gruesome detail. The main building of the unit's headquarters in Harbin has been turned into a museum. 150,000 people visit each year. I'm 他根本不把，尤其是无论是中国的呃男人、呃女人，还有儿童，他们根本不把它当人看，只是当成一个没有感情的一点动物。诶，この人が日本にやってきてね、キリスト教を伝えると。で、Japanese children are given a very different version of history. Few of these students have ever heard of 731. Pupils are taught virtually nothing about the Second World War. Most teachers leave the subject out of class altogether, saying they don't have time to cover it. どうしてもやっぱり日本の場合、その戦争、天皇についてはこれは触れるのはタブーだっていうようなまあ漠然とした雰囲気と言いますかね、あの意識がありますので、ですからまあ高等学校までの勉強では。大学受験でその部分がせあの出されないので、えー、そう触れる必要もなかろうっていう感覚になるんだろうとは思いますね。ポルトガル人が種ヶ島。Many school textbooks present Japan as a liberator rather than invader, a victim, not an aggressor. If the Ministry of Education had their druthers, it would be an orchestrated collective amnesia. In terms of the textbook screening process, they have presided over a long-term whitewashing of Japan's past, particularly the shared past with Asia. I think there has been, in the past, a tendency to sweep the unpleasant history under the national tatami mat. This is the public face of Japanese denial. An ultra-nationalist group prowling the streets of Tokyo. There are more than 900 groups like this one. They're well organized and well connected, with ties to the ruling Liberal Democratic Party or LDP. An increasing number of Japanese are questioning the country's past, but for the government, the issue is taboo. It remains captive to a nationalist constituency. It's not like in uh, France or in Germany or in Great Britain, where the ultra-nationalists basically are out of the mainstream political you know, debate. I mean, they are part of the mainstream. Japan's denial is extraordinary, but so is the overseas reaction. If the German government were to refuse to acknowledge the Holocaust, there'd be international outrage. When Tokyo does something similar with Unit 731, though, there's barely a murmur outside Asia. One reason is that the United States did a very dirty deal, a deal that renders its crusade against biological weapons in Iraq ironic, to say the least. Tokyo, 1946, and with the war over, the war crimes trials began. None of Unit 731's leaders were charged with any crime. The Americans saw to that. They wanted this, Japan's warfare data, and did a secret deal with General Ishii to get it. With the Cold War underway, Washington was terrified the research would fall into Soviet hands. I mean, this is the first time that people, scientists, could get access to human guinea pigs subjected to various germs and various medical experiments. So for the Americans, they offered immunity because they wanted 
you know, the unique access to all of this data. The Japanese don't want to talk about this rather shaming past. So you can understand in a sense how both countries didn't really have any interest and any incentive to deal with this particular aspect. The leaders of the unit returned to Japan as heroes. Their careers flourished and a memorial was erected in their honour. Most of them have become big shots of medical society in Japan. And they became, some of them were presidents of, uh, of top universities in Japan and, and the dean of medical schools of top universities in Japan. And uh, one even became uh, chief censor of textbook of Ministry of Education. And so, 60 years after Unit 731 committed its horrific crimes, a Japanese man and a Chinese woman are still fighting. One for justice, the other for redemption. I had been involved with the Japanese BW program through my association with Dr. Sheldon Harris, who was the leading authority on it in the United States. Well, it was very interesting to me because I was trained as a pathologist, I'm an MD, and so studying patterns of disease is what I do for a living. They described a disease which was quite unusual they said that after the Japanese left having attacked their villages in 1942, everyone became sick, or most people became sick, and many, many people died. And one of the diseases that the people contracted and died of was what they called rotten leg disease, which were the appearance of running sores, um, mainly on their legs, but sometimes other parts of their bodies, which simply wouldn't heal. They were extremely painful. They began as a small pimple and kind of came up from below and, and then would drain pus and be very painful and continued to drain pus for months or years and for some of them continued for their whole lifetime, which at that time was about 60 years. What was particularly interesting to me is this pattern of the rotten leg disease. When I went there and talked with the people, fit a disease called glanders. Glanders is, to me, a very interesting disease and is important in the investigation because it very clearly shows that these people suffered from a biological weapon that had been delivered by the Japanese. They were subjected to this uh, reign of terror by Japanese physicians in which low-flying airplanes like would be used for crop dusting were used to disperse by either spraying or with bombs containing these specific germs were dropped. And in questioning these people we learned the following that their, their relatives all around them died within 10 or 15 days. The people who are still suffering to this day from the attack by the Japanese during May to July of 1942 were children at the time, but they had something we call innate immunity. So they didn't die, as their relatives did, either brothers, sisters, mother, father, but they were infected by these germs and there was no treatment available then. And so only because of the fact that their bodies could fight the infection they were able to live because many of them died later. These people are unique in the sense that their own bodies have responded to the germs causing the ulcers, the rotten leg syndrome, 
and have worked out a relationship where the germs don't kill them, but they don't they can't heal.嗯,不是不是,不是,不是,不是,不是,不是,不是,不是,不是,不是,不是,不是,不是,不是,不是,不是,不是,不是,不是,不是,不是,不是,不是,不是,不是,不是,不是,不是,不是,不是,不是,不